Hi guys, how's it going? Um, today is the first actual episode uh, focusing on budget guitars. Um, and seeing as it's the first episode, uh, I figured I'd go with my first guitar, which is the Epiphone Les Paul Jr. Uh, I think this one is about a 2006. Um, not entirely positive on the year it was made. Um, it was actually sold to me by a very good friend of mine, uh, Mike, um, and he sold it to me for £80 because at the time uh, I'd previously been learning bass um, and I told him that you know I was interested in learning guitar because I was starting to record at home, so this is 2006, uh, and he said, yep, yeah, I've got a guitar just lying around that I don't use, uh, it's yours for 80 quid, so I had a look at it, loved it, took it away. Now, as you can probably tell, uh, this is heavily modified. Um, I did try and leave it in original condition for quite a few years because, well, just because of the sentimental value of it being my first guitar. Um, and it served me well uh, when I was, well, when I was first learning. Um, absolutely adored it. It feels, it still feels so comfortable to use. It's nice and light, uh, which is one of the benefits of the Les Paul Juniors. Um, <clears throat> and Epiphone, they can't really go wrong with this one. Uh, you can usually find them second hand about what I paid for them. Sometimes 70, sometimes 100, it depends on who's selling it really. Um, my advice would be you can't really go wrong with it unless it's, you know, there's something like a, say there's a chip in the neck or something that's making it uncomfortable to play or if the frets are too badly worn to use it, it's probably not worth the money to have it. Uh, refretted um, or repainted so just bear that in mind if you ever see one and consider buying it um, otherwise it's an absolutely cracking guitar the only thing I will note about Epiphones uh, that I found so far is that for some reason the G always goes sharp uh, which seems to defy physics because while you're playing it it should technically go flat because it would stretch as you're playing it or at least it would in my mind. Um, if anyone else has a clue on why it does that, then you know, drop me a message and educate me. Now, to go through the modifications I made on this one, there wasn't actually anything I had to do to make it playable because uh, my friend Mike had had it uh, from new uh, and it had been set up when he bought it. So he'd barely used it because it was just a backup guitar. And when it came to me, it had just been sat in a garage for a few weeks, um, which hasn't seemed to have affected it, because you've got to be careful about where you leave guitars. Garages are an awful place unless it's in um, a hard case with a lot of lining, because any extremes of temperature can greatly affect the warp of the neck. Um, and ideally, you don't want any warp in the neck at all. But if it gets too hot it'll expand and if it gets too cold it'll contract and because it's wood due to the nature of what it is it's you know it's an organism it changes at different rates so you won't just end up with a slightly scrunched up guitar it'll just twist um, but getting back to the modifications I've done a fair bit to it recently um, Here's a picture of what it looked like originally. Now, as you can see, it had a black scratch plate, uh, a humbucker, which is fairly unusual for the juniors because most of the time they come with the P90s. Um, but no, mine came with the humbucker. Um, and, you know, very basic Epiphone wraparound bridge. So, getting back to the modifications. The first thing that I probably did was change the bridge. There was nothing wrong with Epiphone's wraparound bridge, 
but I felt that it could benefit from something where you could alter the intonation um, because I always found that the as you get further up the neck towards the twelfth, um, you you know you, tunings go out slightly. But that was just down to personal preference. I mean, a lot of people, if they're using uh, a wraparound on their first guitar, they're not really going to notice. Um, but I was using it for home recordings, so I was a little bit more focused on how perfect the sound was. The second thing I did after I added the bridge was I added this tailpiece. Um, through nothing more than aesthetics. But because I added the tailpiece, uh, the wraparound didn't work as a wraparound anymore, which meant that had it just sat there, it could have moved back on itself, causing a changing in tuning. So what I did was I used locking bridge posts, uh, which clamped down on the bridge. The third thing I did, again, just for looks, was the pickup cover. Originally it had uh, an open uh, black bobbin pickup, uh, still under there, but I've got, I, you know, I spent 50p uh, on a pickup cover from China. Um, most of the parts I do get are budget parts. Uh, again, sort of adding into the whole creating a great instrument on a shoestring idea. Um, then I added the Bakelite knobs. I was I toyed with the idea of just getting regular plastic chicken heads, or maybe you know something like the old aluminium style uh, knobs, but. I felt that because I was going towards a 50s club style guitar, I thought I'd try and get as near to the 50s as possible uh, and went for the Bakelite knobs. And to be honest, you can't really tell that they're any different from plastic. But I know, and that's, you know, that's why it's important. Uh, the last and hardest thing was the scratch plate. Uh, I had previously made a clear scratch plate because I wanted to show off the uh, the beautiful uh, sunburst that it's got going on. Um, but after a while, I sort of grew a bit tired of it. And when I did these modifications, I decided, sod it, let's throw a pearl scratch plate on there to uh, you know just give it a proper vintage look. And to top it off, I added a uh, pearl white truss rod cover. Uh, I've not changed any of the tuners on this and I've not changed the nut. Uh, everything else is, well, there's not very much left but what was left was stock. Not changed the electrics in it at all. Uh, I've not even added strap locks onto this one which is quite strange because most of my guitars, as you'll notice, uh, do have strap locks on because at the end of the day, you've put a bit of work into a guitar, you don't want to just drop it on the floor and see it shatter. Um, because you will die a little inside. Um, but yeah, that's about it for this. Uh, it feels solid. Um, the build quality is fairly good uh, by budget standards. Um, obviously... You know, any Gibson nut will come along and say, "Oh, the Gibson Junior was the best one," and you, you know, this is just a cheap imitation made by Gibson's sister company. They're only licensed to do it. Even Gibson released the Junior as a budget model, so people who make the Gibson Junior out to be anything other than it is are just grasping at straws. Uh, you'll find. There are a lot of people, and I'm probably going to get some comments on this, there are a lot of people who will defend Gibson and Fender and Ibanez and all those sort of companies to the death. And at the end of the day, it's just about preference. I'm not here to tell you, you know, I'm not here to tell you if you've spent two grand on a guitar, you're an idiot. I'm here to, you know, 
show you not to just overlook budget guitars because you know they've all got their value so let's see how it sounds So there you have it, the Epiphone Les Paul Jr. If you do have any questions uh, on anything I may have overlooked, then feel free to comment. Um, and if there's anything in particular you want me to review, if I have access to it, then I will. Um, so thanks for watching. <laughs>